Hello people and um, welcome to this lecture. Um, so our previous lecture we talked about economic globalizations and how that has contributed to economic inequalities. And um, today I want to talk about environmental inequalities instead. Not that economic or environmental inequalities are necessarily very separate from each other, they're actually tightly entangled, especially if you want to look at um, multi-dimensional poverty. So environmental inequalities um, has definitely also worsened um, in the era of neoliberalization. And we are going to look at it, um, the process of it. So um, to structure today's lecture, I will talk about um, uh, environmental inequalities at different levels. Um, so between countries, um, between the existing political boundaries that we understand, um, today in our world and uh, within countries, as well as within uh, single communities. Um, and you will see that um, throughout this lecture, we will talk on a lot of factors that we have actually talked about before, such as rural, urban, or social positions like gender and race. The first type of um, environmental inequalities we can discuss here belong to um, exchange between countries, unequal ecological exchange. So I have directed you in one of the class reading to, eat, to read about ecologically unsustainable trade. So in the neoliberal era, um, capital liberalization allows investors to enter and exit countries easily, allowing them to relocate to keep their profit and save costs. So we call this spatial fix, right? Um, capitalists are able to conduct spatial fix to always ensure they are maximizing their profit. So when you relocate your industry, you are also um, relocating the extractions of um, natural resources and energy from one country to the other. So due to spatial fix, as well as international trade, some countries are actually exporting much more material than what they import. Some many ago, um, in their papers, they talk about physical trade deficit, which means a country is kind of exporting uh, more material than what it imports. So there is a net outflow of material. So um, this paper looks at how um, different countries in Latin America are doing in terms of importing and exporting material. Right, this is a relatively simple um, representation. So you can see that, um, for example, here in Argentina, anything above zero is what they import. Anything below zero is what they export. And um, they have put the import and export material in terms of million tons. So you can see that um, Argentina is really importing much less than what it exported. And so was Brazil. So was Colombia and so was Ecuador. It's always um, very obvious, like it's not even close when you look at the positive figure and the negative figure. So the reason why this is happening um, mostly is because when countries import something, they need to have enough um, international currency uh, to buy those imports. And um, so they also need to export in order to get um, the resources to import those material. So because probably because of everything that this country exports is in a much lower cost or it's much cheaper in terms of monetary value compared to the imports they are somehow forced to export a lot more material than importing right but this is just a very um sort of um superficial data because it only look at um the material content of import and export and didn't look at um, resources that go behind this import and export. So I have another figure here um, talking about what kind of resources are required by having a coffee export. So this table is particularly looking at Kenyan coffee export to the Netherlands. And um, you can see that um, coffee involves land use, involves water use, involve um, energy, um, no matter where the energy comes from, it's likely to come from um, fossil fuels or coal energy, um, but also possibly some renewable energy. And then also labor, 
right? And then this is um, the emissions of carbon dioxide, um, kilogram of carbon dioxide. Um, so these are all the resources they are required, right, um, to produce Kenya coffee. And this will not be captured in terms of just looking at the kilogram that Kenya is exporting. These resources, when they are used for planting coffee, you also have to remember that that means that they become unavailable for something else. So maybe land is unavailable to um, produce food crop, which is something we talk about a lot during rural poverty when you focus your country policies to export crops. And then water. Water might not be available um, for local consumption, right? Um, and um, there have been controversies by um, Nestle, a Coca-Cola factory in India, in several places in India, that they have severely depleted groundwater level at the expense of local people who are usually poor and have difficult access to clean water, right? So, and um, perhaps the most comprehensive way so far um, to date um, to look at um, whether a country is um, living sustainably ecologically is to look at ecological footprint. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this um, term. Um, so basically, um, what is the ecological footprint? To put it simply, it is the area of ecologically productive land and water that is able to provide all energy and material resources required to support a particular population or economy as well as to absorb waste from them. So this is the simple definition of ecological footprint. And usually ecological footprint is an underestimation because it cannot account for highly toxic material that has permanent damage and also it is very hard to take into account land area for producing non-renewable energy. You might be able to take into account carbon footprint, how much carbon dioxide is emitted through the process, but it's very difficult to also look at the end area for producing non-renewable energy. So um, what is ecological overshooting? So when the ecological footprint of a population or an economy is exceeding the biophysical capacity of its territory, then it achieves ecological overshooting. So what happens during this time? Um, number one, they could be um, eroding their own capacity. So maybe their environment is continuously degrading. Uh, in a way that is unsustainable because it cannot be renewed in time um, with the speed and the amount they're using. Or they are just importing most of um, these needs um, from the other countries. So this is the world map showing um, places or countries which are ecologically deficit and ecologically um, still have reserve um, remained. So um, the red colors are countries which are ecologically deficit and the green colors are the opposite, right? So um, ecologically deficit country doesn't really mean that they themselves are degrading their own environment unsustainably. It could be so, but it could also mean that they are simply importing most of their needs from the other countries. So um, the concept of ecological deficit and ecological reserve um, doesn't allow us to uh, understand how much a country is actually um, importing um, to fulfill their own needs or how much uh, are they actually degrading their own environmental base. And similarly for green countries, doesn't mean that they are not exporting anything to the other countries or doesn't mean that they are not importing things from the other countries too. So they might still export resources to other countries and still um, able to maintain themselves as a reserve or even though as a reserve, they might still be importing things from the other countries, right? So for example, Canada. Canada is also a big importing countries even though it is an ecological reserve. Okay, country overshoot days 2020. Uh, when would all Earth overshoot day land if the world's population live like which country, right? Earth overshoot days um, basically means um, the day when the Earth reaches its limit and cannot regenerate itself sustainably in time. 
So you can see Carda and Luxembourg is very early. If everyone lists like people in Carda, it will be finished by February 11th. Luxembourg, interestingly, small country. If everyone lives like a Luxembourg person, the earth will reach its limit by February 16th, right? And then it seems like the most sustainable way of living is Indonesia. And of course, Indonesia is a vast region and people live very differently. But this is like a per capita thing. Um, so if everyone in the earth lives like an Indonesian on average, the earth can last until December 18 before it starts to degrade itself. So the answer here is probably the earth is already degrading itself at different rates at different places. We have China here in June 13th, um, Singapore April 11th. Okay, so the myth of the environmental Kuznets curve. So environmental Kuznets curve is kind of a famous curve in environmental economics. So it talks about how as country becomes more and more rich, they will care about environmental degradation more. So environmental degradation will actually decrease. So you will see that um, when the GDP per capita is very low, um, actually environmental degradations um, will be rising um, along with GDP per capita. And then um, it will reach a turning point, a peak point, um, when it becomes industrial economics. And then um, it will turn into post industrial service based economy, and the environmental degradations will reduce. But um, this ignore um, unequal ecological exchange between countries because um, this might be the environmental degradation is reducing might be because of countries are just importing more and more of their resources from the other countries. Okay, so ecologically and sustainable trade. So international trade actually blurs responsibility of ecological impacts of consumption because it is very hard for you to descend um, what exactly is the impact of each country. But we, even though we can kind of guess based on several indicators we have such as ecological footprint and also um, phys um, physical trade deficit but still for a usual for day-to-day -day consum consumers it is very difficult to see uh, what is the impact of our consumptions on other parts of the world and when countries produce material, including for export, beyond their biocapacity, they are conducting ecologically unsustainable trade. So strong countries dependent on external resources usually will try to import more to ensure their positional competitiveness for future import. So countries that rely on other countries for their ecological resources, they need to increase their security by becoming a bigger buyer to ensure that they always get these resources and to avoid them being denied these essential resources. So you can see a positive feedback cycle here that um, countries just keep importing in order for them to be able to import in the future. So Anderson and Lindro actually suggest that the peripheral countries should cooperate in order to raise the relative value of their biocapacity on the world market. Um, so rather than um, race to the bottom, having very cheap um, prices or volatile prices for their commodities, they should work together and set a market value for them um, so that um, they are not cheaply selling their biocapacity. And the core countries should reduce their dependence on import, but that will threaten their positional competitiveness. Um, so this is a dilemma that core countries have to look at. And fundamentally, they bring in an idea that trade is not always good, right? They are ecologically unsustainable trade. And in fact, trade is a zero-sum game, um, especially in terms of ecological material. So the more I export to you, the more country A exports to country B, the less country A can use its ecological resources for something else, for its own population, so find something else that's more essential to support its own population. So this is a zero sum game. So this is actually totally um, going against the neoliberal propagations that trade is always always good. The, I also asked you to read an article about um, the oil spill in Nigeria and the plights of people in Nigeria. And this has been occurring for many years by now. Um, people are really suffering there. You can see um, this is their river, um, how they are polluted by oil spill in the area. 
and then um, there are even rising um, rebellion groups, armed groups that this group calling themselves Niger Delta Adventures in 2016, June 2, we just blew up two Chevron oil wells. So for them, the enemy is the Chevron oil that um, pollute the environment without compensations and um, without any real intention to solve the problem sustainably. So it, environmental conflict definitely um, leads to armed conflict. Um, so just some quotation um, from the article. Rivers, lakes, and ponds are polluted with oil, and much of the land is now impossible to farm. Canals or slots have permanently damaged fragile ecosystem and led to polluted drinking water and death from cholera. Gas flaring and the construction of flow stations near communities have led to severe respiratory and other health problems. And Ken Sarariwa, uh, who is a leader of the Ogoni movement, who passed away, um, executed by the Nigerian government for being an activist um, against um, oil extractions uh, in their regions. Um, and what he say here is to live a day in Nigeria is to die many times. Unequal ecological trade has actual consequences on people's life. It's not just figures looking at who is ecological deficit, but this translates into pollutions and translates into resource extraction then translates into lives of people. Pause here a little bit and I want to pose these questions. Um, do you see any relevance of dependency or world system theory in understanding ecological unequal exchange between countries? Um, so take a minute to answer these questions.